welcome to our UNSDG Global Partners Research Forum 2022. Uh, celebrating Earth Day this year, we're looking at SDG 13 Climate Action. Um, and students from, uh, students from all of our institutions have been taking part in poster competitions, research poster competitions around SDG 13. And they are here today to present and celebrate their hard work and posters uh, to us all. Um, so I'll now very briefly take you through uh, the running order of the event. Um, we'll shortly have a welcome from Professor Yuan at National Taiwan University and then we'll jump straight into the student poster presentations. Um, and the way that's going to work is students will present for five minutes each by institution. So for instance, students from Indiana will present and then we'll break for two minutes for questions and then student from National Taiwan University will present then we'll break for two minutes for questions and so on and so forth until uh, all the students have presented and then we'll break into small discussion groups, uh, three small dis discussion groups uh, to talk about some of the topics and themes that all of our presenters, presenters have touched on. Um, and then we will feed that back, feed those discussions back to the broader group before a closing remark, remarks via video from Professor Sharma at OP Jindal. Um, I think it goes without saying that we'd, we'd very much like you to be respectful to all of our presenters, so please leave your microphones muted whilst people are presenting um, and unless you're answering or asking a question. Uh, and obviously any sort of behaviour that we deem inappropriate will result in immediate removal from the forum. Um, so thank you all very much for being here and I'd like to extend a special thank you to my colleagues at Indiana University, National Taiwan University, OP Jindal, UNAM, Moy University and ha University of Hamburg for helping me to pull this together and getting us here. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Professor Yuan, uh, Vice President for International Affairs at National Taiwan University. Thank you so much for being here, Professor. Thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone joining the forum from seven different universities and time zones. I'm Professor Xiaowei Yuan, the Vice President for International Affairs at National Taiwan University. Today it is my privilege to be as the representative of NTU and also a new member to the UNSDG Global Partner Network to give an opening address to this wonderful Global Partner Research Forum, Sustainable Forum in Focus. In 2015, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development was adopted and promoted by the United Nations. 17 sustainable development goals are outlined to help realize a world of peace and prosperity. As the hub of research, innovation, and education in the global society, we as universities have important roles at the front line in creating a sustainable future. In 2018, Indiana University founding member of the U.S. Sustainable Development Solutions Network started this great initiative to invite international partners across the world to devolve into sustainable issues. With joint effort, students and young researchers are provided with special opportunities to present their innovative thinking and hands-on projects with peers from different culture backgrounds and uh, showcase their ability to impact the global society to a better future. As the flagship university in Taiwan, National Taiwan University has gone a long way in practicing a sustainable future. Over 950 sustainability-related courses were offered by 55% teaching units in the past semester, while over 200 sustainable research projects are carried out by our faculties. Office of International Research and Social Responsibility and Office of Sustainability were established to oversee the devotion and future planning at the university level. In 2019, NTU adopted a new principle to divest endowment funds from high polluting and high carbon emitting industries, became the first university in Asia to do so. This time, we are very honored and excited to be invited by our dear partners to be part of the UNSDG Global Partner Network. Special thanks to Rita Korean, 
Assistant Vice President for International Affairs at Indiana University for leading the initiative, to Hamburg University for introducing us to the network and to all colleagues and students who devote themselves into this uh, sustainable future to make this forum possible. I look forward to your exciting and fruitful sharing in the coming session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Yuan. Um, so without further ado, I'll stop sharing my screen and I will jump straight in to the student presentations. Um, would Thomas Day of Indiana University please share your screen and start your presentation? Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm just going to get this in the presentation mode. Can everyone see it? Yeah. All right. Um, so, hi, my name is uh, Thomas Day. I had the great privilege of working with uh, Dr. Jessica O'Reilly on the uh, implementation gap of negative emission technologies. So, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 13.2 uh, aims to integrate climate change measures into national policies, strategies, and planning. However, our project noticed an implementation gap in reaching this target. Um, in the most recent IPCC scenarios, uh, to limiting warming to less than two degrees by 2100, that requires negative carbon dioxide emissions after achieving net zero emissions after 2050. What this basically means is that we'll need negative emission technologies and heavy CDR, carbon dioxide removal, as part of our climate action portfolio moving forward. However, we're not seeing this in the policy. So the aim of this project was to looking at what explains the science to policy implementation gap uh, and how is this inconsistent with SDG goal 13.2. So we had two methods of doing this. Uh, the first, we had the, we got to do some contextual research on negative emission technologies uh, and some of the climate action plans. Um, and then second, we had the great privilege of going to um, COP26 uh, last November in Glasgow and we got to do some semi-structured interviews, talking to delegates and scientists about um, carbon dioxide removal and negative emission technologies. Uh, and we came up with three big uh, results. Um, I'll move to those now. The, the first one was in our climate action portfolio by 2050, we'll see a gradual shift towards carbon removal with long-lived storage. Right now we're doing a lot of um, avoiding emissions and emission reductions without much storage and a little bit of afforestation, which is short-lived storage. By 2050, we really need to move towards um, carbon removal with long-lived storage. So this means things like bioenergy, with carbon capture storage, or direct air capture. Um, figure two kind of shows this, this shift in our portfolio. Um, and by 2050, that's really where we need to be. Um, our second result was we noticed when we were talking to delegates, there's a debate on the realistic deployments of these technologies. Um, one of these technologies kept coming up repeatedly. And this was bioenergy with carbon capture storage or, or BEX. Um, and some of the models in which BEX is used, including the IPCC scenarios, um, BEX has some problems because due to its large scale resource use and um, land use, um, it can threaten other planetary boundaries, including land use change, water use, altercation of biogeochemical flows, and it might compromise biosphere integrity. Um, and then secondly, it's never been implemented successfully in a large scale, despite being one of these key technologies used by the IPCC scenarios. Um, and then our third result was, um, I'm just you guys here. Um, the third result was um, the waiting game. Right now, there's a high prevalence of CCS, which is carbon capture and storage projects in the world, um, but this is not carbon removal yet. So we, we're, we're, a lot of delegates say, are saying that they're interested in CCS, um, and there's interest in the future about implementing carbon dioxide removal, but they're kind of waiting for these technologies to mature. And, and you can see this in chart one. There's a lot of development and construction of carbon dioxide storage but there's, there's not too much yet in the other categories, which are the removal categories. Um, before I get into my conclusion here, I just want to point out this one project. This is 
the largest CDR project in the world. Um, and it's the Kleinworks Orca project in Iceland. And this sequesters about 4,000 metric tons of CO2 per year. Um, and it costs about $600 to sequester or to capture one metric ton of CO2, making it the most expensive option on the market. Um, to put this into perspective, what 400 metric tons is, um, that's about three seconds of humanity's total carbon emissions a year. And this takes a whole year for it to sequester that. Um, and some reports say that a thing like this project, the Orca project, would need to be as uh, implemented as much as like a Starbucks is on every corner to be effective. So it's expensive and it has a lot of, um, it's slow. So and now to my conclusions, there's, there's three big ones. Uh, and the first is there's significant interest at the moment in CCS um, and people are developing it. Um, second, there's interest in carbon dioxide removal, but there's hesitation in implementing it until it's more tested and it's less expensive. And then the last one, which is the most crucial, uh, carbon dioxide removal is required in achieving 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100, um, but the global response cannot lose sight of the more important goal of mitigation and adaptation, which can decrease the reliance of these technologies in the future. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to hearing everyone else um, speak. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was that was uh, really insightful and brilliant. Um, I, it occurs to me now that I completely forgot to introduce our academic lead from Newcastle. Um, we have Tracy Scurry with us, who was supposed to be handling the student presentations, uh, but unfortunately I sort of steamrolled it over that a little bit. So I'll introduce her now. Uh, just before we hand over to uh, Dylan of Indiana. So thank you so much. I'll let you take it from here, Tracy. Oh, hi. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, no need to worry about that. I'm here. Nice to meet everyone and see everyone. I'm really pleased that this is happening again. So a uh, great presentation already. Looking forward to hearing the rest. So uh, it's the next presentation now, is it, Adam? And then, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll be in and out managing the questions. I get to share my screen. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, so my name is Dylan Patterson. Uh, I am a grad student at IUPUI uh, and also an intern in our Office of Sustainability. IUPUI is a urban campus in the heart of Indiana and then Indiana itself is centrally located in the United States. Just also wanted to thank my faculty advisor, Jessica Davis, who is our director of sustainability at IEPY. This project covered work I did in the summer of 2021, mainly uh, mapping out the trees across our IU campuses with the end goal of running that data set through a tool created by the US Forest Service called iTree. Uh, and then that would spit out quantifiable data about our trees, numbers such as carbon sequestration, carbon storage, pollution removal, et cetera. Uh, the data we collected on the trees in the system was split into two different parts. First being data points that iTree needed to run the model. Uh, so that was diameter at breast height, condition of the tree, canopy health. And then there was another section we created for maintenance related points that would be helpful for the management of our tree canopy by our grounds departments. So those were things such as uh, if there was irrigation at the tree, if there were pest issues at the tree, soil disturbances, et cetera. Uh, this structure allowed for the tool that we built to be used for more than just our unit to like get data on our trees. It also made it a benefit to the grounds crew themselves, um, especially for smaller campuses that maybe had less funds or a smaller crew, having all of this data in an online tool allowed them to better manage their tree canopy. Uh, the reason we pushed to do this project uh, was because the natural environment doesn't always have a way to tell you what its benefits are. Uh, so this project was an attempt to bring actual data to our campus administration to justify more support of our natural environment and also assist our campuses in their management of the, their tree canopy. Uh, the project started with work being done here at IUPUI. We realized that IU Bloomington, our main campus was doing something very similar. So we decided 
we should just standardize this process. After doing that, we were able to take uh, that to the seven other campuses, train faculty and student teams on each of those campuses on how to do the tree survey. Uh, so that in the end, we have now full data sets for all of our trees across all the IU campuses and are able to tell a full story of what our trees are benefiting or how our trees are benefiting us across all of our campuses. Um, when Jessica and I were planning out this poster and connecting it to SDG 13, I was thought a lot back to how we talk about sustainability solutions are often talked about as being locally based, uh, but I thought this was a cool project and in, in its example of how this solution worked for us at, IU, at IUPUI, also worked at IU Bloomington and we were able to make it work for all of our other campuses and I feel like that also shows that it could be replicated in other areas as well. Uh, we also brought in some case studies and interesting examples of how GIS technology was being used uh, in other parts of our country and other parts of the world uh, to support protection and management of the natural environment. Uh, and then, so let me move the phases out of the way like Thomas did. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the data we obtained from our IU system tree inventory will be used not only to improve our collective tree care efforts, uh, but also allow the university to begin to determine the environmental, social, and economic benefits that our trees provide to IU. Um, measuring and verifying carbon sources and sinks is often a challenge. However, the combination of GIS mapping and the iTree report addresses a portion of that challenge by delivering information on the quantified benefits IU's trees are offering the community. And then finally, as IU looks towards a commitment to carbon neutrality, understanding the amount of carbon sequestered by our campus forest will offer tangible benefits to IU and beyond. So with that, uh, thank you for having me and for letting me share the work I did uh, last year with you guys. Cool. There we go. So we'll now move on to our next presenter from National Taiwan University. Hello, can you see my screen? Hello everyone, uh, I'm Wu Ting Ling, and you can also call me Vicky. And my advisor is Dr. Diane Dennis, he's also uh, in this room too. And uh, today I am sharing my research, and the topic is habitat change and its consequence on the UC specialization at the Biogeographic Transition Network. So, as you may know, global warming is transferring the ecological community. In the transition zones between tropical and temperate regions, there is a phenomenon called tropicalization. It means that in this transitional zone, uh, the species with warm affinity is expanding their distribution per year, while the species with cold affinity is contracting their distribution per year. And among these marine species, reef fishes are an ideal sentinel of this environmental change because they respond uh, quite fast to the changes in temperature and also the basic habitat. Uh, in the past, the temperature was often the only forecast when studying the impact of global warming on reef fish. Other factors were often ignored, especially the basic habitat they heavily rely on. Therefore, the first question I want to ask here is what are the effects of habitat change of fish fauna and also what are the fish sentinels of the temperature and the habitat?
So to answer this question, uh, we conduct a, a scuba diving uh, to survey the fish and basic community. And we conduct our survey at the 18 locations along the east coast of Taiwan and investigate the temperature anomaly in the past three decades. We found that there is a warming uh, trend around the waters of Taiwan. In average, uh, it had increased 0 0.27 degrees. And we also found that the basic habitat uh, changed latitudinally and can be partitioned into the tropical and the subtropical habitat. And for fish, we identified 184 species. And among these uh, species, we first selected the tropical and the subtropical habitat specialists. They are the fish species either frequently appear in one of the habitat, or when they appear, they will always appear in the same habitat. Accordingly, we identify seven subtropical specialists and 15 one uh, tropical specialists. Then we would like to know the reason why those specialists appear in the habitat. Is it due to the temperature or the basic habitat they would have? So after applying the joint species distribution model, we found that most of the species respond to both uh, temperature and habitat. And the remaining species respond only to the temperature or only to the habitat. So combine the results from the two analyses, we propose these three species, uh, Kormis, Majoritifers, and Teleolatris everyday and Salasoma lutefisis as the sentinels of the temperature and basic habitat changes in Taiwan. Since their distribution is strongly constrained by temperature and basic habitat rather than the other factor, once the temperature or the basic habitat change because of global warming, they may be the first species to move forward. So overall, the sentinels proposed here could be the indicator of first the global warming or the global migration of the basic capital or both combined. And this information will be important for the monitoring of the global warming impact on the real ecosystem. And based on this finding, we also hypothesize that the, the tropicalization in this transitional zone might be characterized by different waves of global expansion in special needs. Since some specialists may need only the temperature in the transitional zone to become suitable, then they can move. While the power expansion of some other specialists may also need the, the basic habitat they rely on to move forward. So now uh, we know the fish assembly interests are highly likely to change uh, under climate change. And we also know which species may have a higher chance to change. So what kind of the actions can we do? Then uh, first, uh, before uh, we know that the global warming may cause some uh, changes in the marine ecosystem, uh, we may not really know how it would change and how to deal with it. Now, the finding of this study suggests that uh, there are a few species may have a higher chance to expand their distribution in Taiwan. And this could be an important information to help the decision making in the national policies, strategies, or the planning. And second, the stakeholders and the institutions that rely on the coastal ecosystems can be informed of this potential change in the event to increase their capacity for mitigation, adaptation, and the impact reduction. So uh, thanks for your listening it's all my uh, talk. Thank you so much for that, that was fantastic. Um, so just before we, uh, before we move on to the next, next presenter, I just thought I'd check in, does anybody have any questions for any of our presenters so far? Silence. In that case, we will move on to our next presenter, and that will be uh, Georgia O'Reilly of Newcastle University. Thank you so much, Georgia.
So hello, my name's Georgia. I'm studying marine biology at Newcastle. Um, so I'm going to be talking about my research, which is using a species Rubisco, which is an enzyme, to enhance carbon dioxide capture by increasing their productivity. Um, I appreciate this post is quite difficult to read from in a presentation like this, so I'm going to break it down a bit. So why did I kind of choose this idea? Um, it was a throwaway comment by one of my lecturers. Um, they were talking about all the technologies that are being developed, the millions and billions of pounds are being spent um, to come up with a new idea, a new solution. Well, plants remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere already. Let's enhance this, let's use what has been happening for billions of years to our advantage. Um, I don't think we have time to go into the whole process of photosynthesis, but basically it's using carbon dioxide to create um, energy rich sugar molecules for plants to grow. Um, and Rubisco, this is where it comes in, in a light independent stage, um, it's called the Calvin cycle. It uses, Rubisco connects carbon dioxide to a sugar. Um, and because of this, it's arguably one of the most widespread enzymes on the planet but it doesn't work as well as it can. There's a lag in its reaction time to changes in solar energy. Um, it also has um, a deactivation rate, which is sort of the time it takes to respond to the shady conditions. And it's these two issues that lead to many, not enough carbon dioxide being removed as it could be. So my post is secondary research. It used some data from Lancaster Uni and the Uni of Illinois they were investigating cowpea, which is a type of lagoon, um, how Rubisco, the variations in the different types of cowpea um, deactivates in response to different light conditions. Um, then I also used the Journal of Experimental Botany, which was studying the variation between induction kinetics in different genotypes of wheat. Um, and then finally, I used the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B, which is again um, looking at variations in productivity between different light conditions. Um, so all of these studies found that it, there is a lot of difference. Um, Rubisco isn't working as well as it can. In Calpi, the um, speed of deactivation was actually more important than the induction time. Um, but either way, the induction time led to 15% less carbon dioxide being assimilated into the plant than in a perfect lab condition. Um, in a particular species, Tritopin acevin, I can't pronounce that very well, sorry, there was um, a potential loss of 21% of carbon just because of the lagging reaction. Um, there was also a noticeable variation in this response time between the different genotypes. So all the data points out that even though we don't fully understand how Rubisco works and what causes these variations, um, that they do exist. It can't be argued. And by selectively breeding them, it will increase productivity which will increase crop yield, so more carbon dioxide will be removed from the atmosphere. Um, it will also address the UN SDG 2, which is zero hunger, um, by increasing global food security. So I think this is definitely something that needs to be researched more. Um, here are my references, and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Georgia. That was brilliant. Um, and we'll now move on to our other Newcastle University presenter, Layla. Let me see if I'm going to share my screen. Mm, this should make it full screen for you. Right. Um, this is my poster, and I broke it down um, into slides on my PhD project, which is called Alive with Miss Buildings. Um, I'm Elena, I'm Ellen, and I have a background in architectural engineering. I think everyone here has a different background. It's really interesting to see how everyone looks at um, their research into um, climate action. Uh, for me, I looked at challenges and related to climate change in the built environment. 
uh, which is not only climate change, but also biodiversity being gradually destroyed and resource depletion is a big challenge in the built environment. And the built environment has a huge impact on all of those. So the IPCC has two strategies um, and it's mitigation and adaptation. And my research looks at adaptation, which uh, the IPCC has defined as the adjustments in natural or human systems in response to actual or expected stimuli or the effects, which moderates harm and explodes beneficial opportunities. Um, so I looked at two challenges in architecture throughout time, and uh, we see that architecture um, has reflected uh, the challenges they are um, having in matters of throughout time, but also geographically. So um, you see the architecture of indigenous um, in vernacular is really um, really used locally. Um, so for example, on the left side, you have igloos which use snow um, to insulate from the cold, while on the far right side, you see in Dubai, these wind catchers um, that try to catch the wind to um, redirect ventilation and cool the buildings. And you can see that these vernacular examples use local materials, uh, which is what led to adaptable and particularly diaphragmatic architecture, which are principles that are still used today. Um, so what I did in my research is I tried to map this really big um, concept of adaptable architecture throughout time. And I could find that there's two sides to it. It's what building components or element change. Um, and those are called the adaptability dimension. So you have buildings that are responsive and dynamic or just for worse to uh, refetable, convertible, stable, or movable. But then on the other hand, it's to what contextual change do they respond to? Uh, and those are leading adaptability strategies, which are divided in three categories, which I will show you right now. So I mapped a lot of adaptability strategies throughout time. So you see we start uh, with vernacular example on the top left. Um, and that is by biothematic and a lot of different uh, strategies in the 60s, uh, which have then evolved. And you can see we've got so many different strands and strategies and um, all of them kind of respond to different aspects of the context. So in green, you can see the responses to environment. So for example, um, zero energy design is trying to uh, react to um, environmental aspects. Well, uh, we have a yellow responses to the user and user needs. So um, trying to uh, get comfort from um, for the people living inside the building. And then you have responses to economy with more economical models, such as design for the assembly and circular economy strategy. Um, and so this really divide uh, into the responses. I try to map what are those responses. Uh, and so I made this contextual framework of to what changes should buildings adapt to. The main reason I'm doing that is that we know from sustainability that we need to address all three pillars of sustainability, of environmental, title, and economical, um, in order to be truly sustainable. So I've mapped all of these and refined the categories. So for example, the environmental is divided in microclimate, urban climate, local climate, and climate change. Um, while responses to society is more the use of comfort, their physiological and psychological aspects, also their behavior in the building, are they opening windows and things. So all of these are aspects that influence adaptable architecture. And then I went a little bit further into depth uh, and divided those into different parameters. So for example, in the local climate in the top right, you can see it's divided in daylight, humidity, temperature, precipitations, and airflow, which are all aspects we need to address into being adaptable in architecture. Um, and especially as climate is changing, um, our humidity and temperature uh, is changing a lot as well. And our buildings really need to adapt to that. So I've mapped all of these strategies, but as you can see, they're all either in one box or, or um, at the overlap of two, but what we're missing is something in the middle, uh, which is what I call rhythmic buildings. And why rhythmic buildings? It's because all of these aspects and parameters change throughout time and change at various rhythms. So you have the daylight rhythm, uh, you have daylight throughout the day and it's dark at night, uh, but you also have these uh, temperature rhythms. Um, for example, here in Newcastle, it's quite warm-ish in the summer <laughs> um, and, and really cool uh, during the winter, so you get the seasonal rhythms. Um, and so to really create this true adaptation to the context, uh, I've made this theoretical adaptability strategy so what, how I'm doing that is I'm developing this toolbox of analysis tools. So we've seen the framework 
also develop the skill tools, also design tools and technological tools, which I won't go into depth now. Uh, and what I'm doing with these tools is I'm testing them out with case studies. So I'm designing a tiny house uh, in Northampton where we analyze the seasonal rhythm and then also Martian habitat that um, I've got back on is space architecture. We analyze the daily and emission rhythm of a crew uh, of four. And my main findings or the main things I want to leave you with is that we will need to go beyond what we already have and the technologies we have now. Uh, we need to um, include biotechnology. And biotechnology at all scales, you see some guy on the left, you see bacterial cellulose in the middle, and then you see algae and um, bacteria um, and, and spores on the left. And we need to work across the whole scale, uh, which is the group I'm part of, it's the hub for biotechnology in the built environment. So we're trying to implement that to create these sorts of buildings. And so we really need to work uh, in an interdisciplinary way to really uh, address adaptation in buildings. That's my main conclusion. <laughs> um, thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for inviting me to um, talk about my research in this global forum. Thank you so much, Leila. Um, again, I'll pause very briefly to see if anybody has any questions and I'll assume nobody does if I'm met with silence. Well, let me let me just uh, thank Leila. I thoroughly enjoyed her presentation. I usually tend to study history when time allows me. So I thoroughly enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anke. <laughs> we should discuss that in the breakout rooms. I'd love to hear more. Um, so I will then move us on to our first presenter from OP Jindal, Sam Junker. Uh, can you hear me? I hope you can hear me. Yes, you are. All right. Uh, Professor Isha is presenting my uh, poster. And I'll go ahead with my presentation. Uh, so I want to start off by saying that the coronavirus pandemic has and continues to lead to a deeper understanding of the ties that bind us on a global scale. Um, well, recent healthcare systems are essential to protect us from health security threats, including climate change. Now, the support to resuscitate the economy after the pandemic should promote health, equity, and environmental protection. Now, lessons we are drawing from the COVID-19 pandemic and how it relates to climate change is that well-resourced, equitable health systems with a strong and supported um, health workforce are essential to protect us from health security threats that most importantly include climate change. Now, this poster essentially talks about how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected climate, climate change, and our collective action in furtherance of the climate change reversal movement, with a little bit more focus around the situation in India. Uh, now, I have written about the initial impact COVID had on climate, climate-related movements, and the extension of the 30s And I, I have also included the long-term advantages and disadvantages that the pandemic had on climate. And lastly, I've talked about the lessons that we've got to learn from the pandemic that we can use to further the uh, collective climate change. So to begin with, uh, I would like to say that 2020 was designated the year of uh, climate action by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. Now, COVID-19 has reversed that progress. Now, climate crisis continues to rage, but COVID-19 has diminished the degree of attention it formerly received. Now, what is unfortunately evident is that the topic of climate change has lately slid off the top of the world's political agenda due to the urgency of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the, the pandemic's consequences are stifling economic growth and slowing development progress in climate change programs, including, most importantly, climate research. Uh, now, while the response action focuses on meeting people's urgent health needs, additional dangers such as climate extremes continue to harm people even today. Uh, but it can't be denied that the major advantageous effect of COVID-19 was the fact that it was speculated to and indeed, they temporarily reduce global emissions of CO2 and other pollutants. Uh, I mean, many nations, including India, responded to the COVID-19 pandemic by restricting travel and other activities during 2020 and, 20, and into 2021. Uh, now, this caused a temporary reduction in global greenhouse gas emissions and local air poll pollution. But we've got to remember that this reduction in the emission level is returning to pre-pandemic level. 
and I've talked about this in the poster too and I've backed it up with empirical data. Now experts warn against seeing short term decrease as environmental decrease. Now global emissions are declining in the short term as they have in the past even during several and severe economic downturns. However, because carbon dioxide can last for centuries in the atmosphere, the total concentration will continue to climb even if we produce less of it. And as soon as the economy starts recovering after the pandemic, so will the emissions. Now, as the pandemic rapidly spreads and affects more and more countries, it becomes clear that it has the potential to disrupt daily life on a global scale. And the change that we, uh, and it also has the potential to change the way that we use energy, burn fuel, and emit pollutants into the atmosphere. Now, it has directly put our infrastructure under huge pressure. It has also had huge impacts on how climate change and its related movements are furthered. Now, apart from many social and economic problems worldwide, the COVID-19 pandemic has also led to a sudden fall in face-to-face -face climate related meetings. For example, it has negatively influenced the works related to the preparation of the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and it has also negatively influenced the organization of the 26th Conference of Parties of the United Nations Framework on uh, convention on climate change so that is the COP26 which was to be held around early 2021 but was postponed to November 2021. Uh, I mean it did happen in the end but a lot of important decisions were put on hold and now what I wish to emphasize in this presentation is that COVID-19 even though it has totally disrupted climate action it, it has uh, shown us one thing that humanity was desperately in need of and that is about how, despite diverting attention away from SDG 13, the international reaction to COVID-19 has established a precedent for the sort of action that may be done to solve a global issue. Now, sustainability activists and experts believe that the pandemic structural alter alterations provide opportunities to emphasize sustainability and execute long-term environmental improvements to current company structures. Now, if mass collective action was possible for a pandemic, then mass collective action is possible to fight the war against climate change too. And yeah, I would like to conclude by saying that the most important thing to remember is that crises like these offer an opportunity for a regained sense of shared humanity in which people realize that what matters most, their health or the safety of their loved ones, and by extension, the health and safety of their community, their country and their fellow global citizens. And what I feel, and I feel that both the climate crisis and the pandemic threaten this one thing that we all care about. So that's my presentation. This is my question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I believe the same person is sharing uh, the next presenter's poster as well. So I think we moved straight on before breaking again for questions, if that's okay. So our next presenter will be Ankit from OP Jindal. Um, I'm just waiting for Professor to share the poster. Oh, there we go. Fantastic. Uh, well, let me begin by thanking the university for giving us young students an opportunity to present uh, something which is close to us, something which is close to their generation, and is also close to the generation which is not even born yet. Climate is something which we all share. Um, and with those words, I'd just like to introduce myself. My name is Ankit Malhotra. I am a student of law at the Jindal Global University in India. I am also the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law. Um, it's such an honor and a privilege to represent my university once again on an international platform. Uh, before I finally begin, I'd also like to thank Professor Purswani, who guided me and uh, tutored me with respect to not only this poster, but also the paper which we are working on together. And uh, I'm quite grateful and honored to work under his tutelage. The title of this poster and also the paper is rather provocative, uh, Activating Climate Change in the Form of Ecocide. Uh, 
what this essentially means is should environmental degradation be punished like a war crime? To further this ambition, a growing movement of activists, lawyers and political leaders say yes. They want to make ecocide or widespread destruction of the environment and international crime. They do so by relying on the International Law Commission's 1991 draft Code of Crimes and Security of Mankind, which proposed the crime as a willful and severe damage to the environment under Article 26. This proposed crime of ecocide builds on the first three core crimes of the statute of, of the Rome Statute, which penalizes uh, international crimes. Uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes, crimes of aggression. So they want to put environmental damage at the same pedestal as, let's say, genocide. Now, what I wish to do in my, the, the remaining time that I have is to speak about India and the uh, environmental measures that India has adopted. Of course, the presentation, or at least the poster that you see on your, on your screens, does not speak about this, and thus I use that as an opportunity to really cover up an aspect which is not there. India, like others, adopts these principles but what ecocide does is it offers a different vantage point what it essentially does is offers a preemptive approach in addition individuals will also be compelled to undertake measures to avoid pollution to lay aid in halting pollution in its birth as opposed to being penalized which is the explanation for the polluters play polluters pay principle in other words the governing principle becomes polluter does not play polluter does not pollute i beg your pardon the protection of interest shifts from those who have few ownerships to the many who are at the risk of suffering. More recently, recently the Indian courts have also acknowledged and paid homage to the principle of ecocide as the destruction of the aspects of the environment which enables to support life. The Indian constitutions, Indian constitution under Articles 21, 32, 48a and Part 3 enshrines the discourse in varying degrees on the environment as well. Let us think of environmental damage as a pendulum, as a shifting pendulum in which the Indian constitution provides protection, enjoyment and the use of the environment on one hand, on the other hand rests the extreme position of protection and on the middle sits the most controversial aspect of this which is the use of environment. Nonetheless, the Indian constitution with all its shortcomings acknowledges the environment. The Indian environmental law and its jurisprudence as I have suggested moves steadily towards ecocide and enshrining ecocide as a principle. Under domestic civil laws, the jurisprudence has moved towards and the possibility of exploring absolute liability under tort law supplanted in ecocide as a crime of offence that needs to be explored further. For India to internalize the international discourse, both precautionary principles of polluters pay should be juxtaposed to the ecocide laws of a country like Vietnam. What is interesting about the country like Vietnam and other countries which I wish to highlight is the severe destruction which these countries suffered due to different reasons. But if there is one reason which one can trace, that shall be war. And in the Vietnam example, the Agent Orange which defoliated approximately 5 million acres of forest in an attempt to expose guerrilla fighters and the entire ecosystem was destroyed therefore. As a result, to protect the environment from future destruction of use, ecocide in the penal code of the Vietnamese code is defined as destroying the natural environment, whether committed in time of peace, war, constitutes a crime against humanities. Another interesting example which I wish to highlight is countries such as Kazakhstan, Belarus, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia are all countries which have an example or a law on ecocide. The common thread between all these countries is, is that all of their former parts of the USSR or the Union of so Soviet Socialist Republics. The reason for this legis legislation is the enormous environmental damage which these countries suffered due to the wars. In sum, 75% of the water was contaminated, great rivers such as the Volga and Don have been damaged and become chemical sewers. Two-thirds of the Aral Sea became an arid, sterile desert, and ecosystems of the Black Sea and Caspian Seas have become damaged beyond repair. So thus, what is one to expect? What is one to look forward to to have an ecocide law which protects the environment? Do we need to reach a stage when an empire or a, a war is to be so devastating that it thus needs to lead to a point of enshrining laws to protect this further? Given that, so that the responsibility to remedy, improve, protect through penal action becomes so necessary and at the absolute last requirement. Given the compensation-oriented approach, ecocide brings a different dimension as I have tried to suggest. 
The hope is that this dimension will offer a different vantage point and the ghost of penal consequences is a sufficient deterrent for those who are willing to sacrifice environmental well-being for personal gains. This can only be achieved if countries internalize inst international instruments and measurements as this article and poster tries to highlight. With that, with that I close and I thank the universities again once again for giving us students an opportunity to present something. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was excellent. Um, I see we did have one question in the chat that has now since been answered. Uh, and I did. I just wanted to just double check one more time. Does anybody have any questions for any of our presenters so far? OK, no problem. I will then move on to our next presenter. Uh, that will be the first one from UNAM, and that will be Anna. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, hello, everyone. My name is Anna Silva and I'm an environmental science student at the University of Nacional Autonoma in Mexico. Uh, first of all, I want to thank my advisor, Alfonso Lopez de Garcia, for all the support throughout this research. Now let's get to the topic. So I'm going to be talking about community management as a climate action tool. To start off, it's important to remember that the model which has prevailed thus far has completely changed our relationship with natural systems and the way that we interact with them, uh, that being evident by signs of degradation, desertification, deforestation, and biodiversity loss, provoked by um, over-exploitation of the natural resources, which then branches out into different social uh, problems, such as the unequal distribution of the resources that are extracted. Um, these goods and services uh, provided by natural environments have uh, been recognized multiple times. And as a consequence of this situation and the recognition of the importance of these resources and what they give to us um, as a society and as humanity as a whole, um, international communities have agreed on mechanisms <coughs> implementing inclusion of environmental management practices as well as collective action in favor of conservation and improvement of resources and their management. This mechanism is typically referred to as community management, which is what this poster is about. So the objective of this research was to demonstrate how community management and social involvement can be effective tools to reach the SDG 13, um, particularly to enhance the management and planning for developed, uh, for country in development, so in development, sorry, um, such as Mexico in this case, uh, which is why the research questions are, what is a community forest enterprise? How are they linked to sustainability? And why are they an important climate action mechanism that could be implemented on a national scale in Mexico? So community forest enterprises are a clear example of community management, given that they are communities who have complete faculty over um, the natural environment which they inhabit, in this case, um, it being forest systems. And they are able to manage how they extract their natural resources and how they distribute the income that they get from those natural resources around the community. And they can focus them on uh, community income, employment, and public goods and services. And another characteristic of forest community enterprises is that they focus and um, encourage a lot the conservation of their natural spaces. This model has been instituted in several countries like Ethiopia, Benin, Tanzania, the Philippines, and Bolivia, and particularly here in, Af in Latin America, Mexico is um, well, a case of success. <laughs> um, from, we have here in Mexico around 250 forests, which are under community management uh, of approximately 1,621 forest community enterprises. And from, in general, from the five 55.3 million of hectares of forests and jungles that cover Mexico, uh, which are represented by the circle that you can see in the middle of the screen. The blue part, uh, which is 80%, is owned by approximately 8,500 ejidos and communities under community management. And then 20%, which is the red and orange part, corresponds to private property. Um, I've divided the results into of the research into successful areas and challenges that these communities have encountered. Mainly, um, these results are based off four forest community enterprises that are located in Sierra Juarez, Oaxaca, which are Mancomunados, Ixtepeque, Trinidad, and Capulalpan. Um, so within the successful areas, uh, the most important ones are the implementation of a specialized administration focused on different production areas, um, which ensure a proper resource exploitation. 
the cultural strengthening through tradition-based techniques and forest conservation. Uh, they have shown international, sorry, internal capacity um, of fam familiar and social nutrient management. They, they have achieved a stable economic state through investments in infrastructure, goods, and public services within the community, um, as well as shown a democratic governance of common use goods and resources. And well, <laughs> what we are interested here because of the SDG 13 is the encouragement of cultural, culture, sorry, conservation through forestry systems, as well as environmental impact awareness and forest conservation. Uh, the main challenges that they have encountered is the dollars of governance systems, of their governance systems by private concessions and over-regulation of forest systems in Mexico, the embezzlement and poor planning of agricultural subsides, um, urban expansion and illegal extraction of forest resources, and the lack of delegation and inclusion of the forest community enterprises' um, benefits within public policies. And now just to bring all of these um, ideas together, um, I just want to close off by saying that forest community enterprises in Ciudad Juarez have managed to successfully and properly exploit their natural resources, um, while at the same time enjoying the benefits that the forest systems provide. And they have also encouraged and implemented conservation of their natural environment given the relationship that they have with it in cultural terms, which is why it is, a, it is of utmost importance to create a synergy between government and these communities to understand the specific needs and dynamics of each forest system, which obviously varies and is different for each one of them, um, in order to properly represent them and protect them within legal frameworks and international agreements. And this is the way that they can work as a climate action tool. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another fantastic presentation. Um, so we'll now move on to our next UNAM presenter. That will be Brandon. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Can you see my screen now? Well, I hope you do. <laughs> as yes. I hear from someone. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Brandon Mejia. I'm currently a student of the Master's in Marine Biology program at UNAM. I would like to thank my advisor, Dr. Susana Enriquez Dominguez. And without further ado, I'll introduce my project. Now, while livestock farming, I'm sorry, while livestock farming is one of the main sources of high protein foods for human consumption, it is also responsible for 14.5% of the global greenhouse gas emissions due to the organic carbon from its waste products and the deforestation necessary for fodder consequently reducing the capacity of the terrestrial plant communities to act as carbon sinks. As an alternative to livestock, phytoplankton culture allows for the production of high quality protein food with low environmental impact. Since photosynthetic production allows to fix atmospheric CO2 into organic carbon, releasing oxygen in the process while producing entirely edible biomass with minimum waste. Among the phytoplankton species that can be used as high protein sources, is Arthrosphera maxima, commonly known as spirulina, a multicellular cyanobacteria that forms trichomes endemic to Mexico. The biomass of this species has a 65% protein content, almost three times as much as beef. This protein content is easily digestible by humans and contains the nine essential amino acids. This biomass also provides a high content of antioxidants and biomolecules of diverse therapeutic interest, such as c picocyanin and sulfolipids. All these features have led to consider the Arthrosphere genus as a superfood. Even though this genus has been broadly studied, most of the attention has been focused on an African species, Arthrosphere platensis. The Mexican species, Arthrosphere maxima, has not received the same attention despite being an ancestral culture dating back to the Mexica civilization. There's numerous records of how the Mexica harvested a green slime taken from the Texcoco Lake and then used it to make special food either for the royalty or their painani, which were their messengers that ran long distances. My research question was, what are the optimal light and temperature conditions for the production of Arthrosmer maxima biomass with high value and low costs? And my objective was to 
and characterize the photochemical response of arthrosperm maxima to both light and temperature and determine the optimal conditions to maximize other production and the quality of said biomass while minimizing production costs. Now, to achieve this, I used an arthrosperm maxima commercial strain and grew it for 15 days, controlling both light and temperature under three different regimes for each variable for a total of nine treatments. To identify the growth conditions that allow the largest biomass production under the lowest resource investment, the final production was normalized by the estimated light and temperature energy costs per treatment. To assess the potential economical benefits of each culture in relation to their production costs, the biomass quality was estimated multiplying the biomass energy ratio by the c phycocyanin content per unit biomass for each treatment. Now, this is a, a multidisciplinary project, which of course incites in four different sustainable development goals, which would be zero hunger, good health and well-being, industry innovation and healthcare, responsible consumption and production, and of course, climate action. After two years of experimentation, we were able to determine that the photochemical response of Arthrosperum maxima involves changes in its growth rates, in vivo light absorption, and its metabolic rates. These adjustments imply changes also in the size and form of individual trichomes independently of their abundance, both uh, considering individual trichomes counted uh, in a new power chamber or the total biomass content for each culture. Using this information, the potential commercial benefit of each growth condition was calculated using the ratio between the average price of the C phycocyanin content per cubic meter produced by each culture, dividing it by the cost of energy to maintain constant illumination and temperature during 15 days for similar culture volumes. What we found that was that Changing the growth conditions of atmosphere maxima to different light and temperature regimes allows control over the commercial quality of the biomass produced due to differential algal acclimatory responses that involve changes in pigmentation, protein, content, and morphological and biochemical adjustments. Now, the cost-benefit ratio was uh, maximized at low light and medium or optimum temperature. Changes in the spiral trichome shape were also observed, which may provide an explanation for the difference we found between pigmentation and in vivo absorption. Although further, further analysis and characterizations of these morphological adjustments are necessary for a deeper understanding of the photochemical response of Atrosperum maxima, characterizing the growth conditions that allow maximizing algal biomass production and quality while minimizing costs sets the basis for developing cultures that generate an important protein food source, rich in antioxidants and other compounds with nutraceutical and therapeutic properties. Said cultures could either be deployed as large scale, highly profitable investment projects or as community or family scale social projects that help supplement nutritional needs while mitigating the greenhouse gas emissions that would result from relying solely on livestock farming as a protein source. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, I am ready to answer. Thank you so much, Brandon. That was fantastic. Um, if there are no questions, I will move on to the next presenter, and that will be me sharing my screen for our first presenter from Moore University. Hello everyone, I'm Damaris Nyambura, I'm from Moy University and I'll be presenting on, my poster is on the role of planting trees in achieving the climate action goals. And to start with, yes, could you zoom a little for me? Yeah, good. Okay. okay, thank you. 
And so my poster is on the role of planting trees in achieving climate action. And the theme is we need to go green. And we need to go green meaning we need to know the impact and the purpose of planting trees. Climate action is one of the 17 SDGs climate established by the UN in 2015 for the purposes of taking urgent measures to combat climate change and its impact by regulating emissions and promoting development in renewable energy. The reason I focused on trees is because the, the emissions are mostly because of the gases, that is the carbon dioxide, sulfur, nitrogen, and the other gases, and the renewable energy, always on most of the energy produced these gases. There are various strategies that are set to combat the climate change. Planting trees being a help in achieving the strategy. This helps in trapping carbon dioxide and other atmospheric gases, which, which could cause global warming. This is, there is great need to identify the role of this event of planting trees in climate change since the practice has been carried out severally, but still the climate is still deteriorating. Over it down. Okay, I got it. I got it. And the method for this research was the desk research, which involved analyzing the analyzing the event and collecting data from the existing or the past previous climate action ambition. And so the data that I obtained was the graph showing carbon dioxide. <laughs> carbon dioxide emissions in its atmospheric concentration. The main purpose for focusing on carbon dioxide was because it is the major aspect contributing to climate change, mostly by, we look at this, if we look at this project, climate action refers to the shift in temperature and the weather patterns. This is influenced by human activities, which include burning of fossil fuels, deforestation and other activities that make make the environment not suitable for living and more so it is it is the okay the climate act the climate change is influenced by the concentration of carbon four oxide in the atmosphere by how it accumulates and leads to uh, acid, acidification of the rains waters and the oceans, rivers, and its aftermath is by reducing the food production, economic growth, and uh, economic growth, population distribution and growth rate, and also the plant and animals diversity. Let's um, move on. the discussion the discussion part. the graph presented above shows carbon four oxide emissions in the atmospheric concentration it indicates that carbon four oxide emission as well as atmospheric con concentration has increased from the year 2020 to 2021 to 2020 sorry and the flow chart indicates the source of carbon four oxide we have seen it from human activities that then it uh, then to how it affects or its aftermath we have seen. Then carbon dioxide like other complex gaseous molecules, it absorbs thermal radiation and holds a large amount of heat in the atmosphere that leads to a temperature increase. This temperature increase is the one that leads to uh, drought and even loss of animal health because the condition is so unsuitable for living and survival because people cannot access services like health, good, good safety food, animals, aesthetic is lost. Then trees play an important role in removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through absorption. 
tea planting campaign has not fully has sorry okay tree planting campaigns have been done in the previous years though has not fully managed the problem of carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere this could be the result of people are not so aware of the greatest role in achieving the sustainable climate conditions this is why it is evident because we have seen from the year 1750 this was the year when the industrial revolution started whereby we had in inventions such as the jigsaw lighting conductor condensing steam eating domestic gas lighting electric batteries and others were implemented on and all for and analyzing those invention invention that's why we saw like it was mostly for energy production and that's where the rate of carbon dioxide has been increasing up to 2020. Then I would recommend that ample time be allocated for implementation of the set policies. In the global tree planting day is a day for implementation of set measures of combating climate change and public sensitization about protection of our environment through planting tree. For instance, if time is allowed for that specific day for implementation of this policy of tree planting, then we could have, we could, this would ensure that at most 75% of people are reached and a larger percentage of trees will be planted. And hence, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere will tend to go drastically down. And having a more habitable atmosphere in terms of increase in oxygen concentration. Because as temperature rises, the rate of oxygen concentration decreases or it moves up. In addition, most people will be educated, leading to a more sensitive and sensitized community that is able to take care of the environment from an point, in a, from an informed point of view. Human activities can save the planet and let's work together to protect our environment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. That was fantastic. In the face of some very sketchy screen sharing from myself, many apologies. Um, I'll now move, move on to our last but not least uh, presenter, Helen from uh, Moy University. Thank you. Let me just um, share my screen. Uh, um, having a bit of a challenge. Wow, I don't know whether I can email this right away. I don't know why it's not working. Um, Zora, would you be able to share Helen's poster? Um, hello, why don't you email me your poster quickly and I'll try and get it up on screen. But in the meantime, could you maybe just quickly talk us through? Ah, oh, there we go. Zura's managed to get uh, her screen up, it seems. Sorry about that. Thank you. Maybe Dr. Zura, you can zoom it a bit. Oh. 
All right, so my name is Helen um, from our university. I'm a student of PhD Development Studies. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Zura and Professor Mulongo who have really helped me in coming up with this work. And so my poster is looking at uh, the action of women in climate change adaptation. As we have all heard from our different presenters is that uh, climate change is a big issue in this century. And of course, in the discussions about adaptation, women have been identified as key change agents. And even before the recognition in terms of adaptation, when we look at the way climate change affects people, it affects them differently. The effects are across differently across age, across uh, gender. And on the gender perspective, we find that women are more vulnerable to climate change than men, mainly because uh, of a poverty uh, perspective and maybe the fact that their roles and responsibilities are so close to the natural environment that is sensitive to the effect of climate change. Uh, and because of these two uh, sort of discourses of where women are more vulnerable and still acknowledged as a change agent, I just uh, went out and did a research to find out like a situational analysis. So where are we in terms of their vulnerability and uh, what are they doing in terms of adaptation? And this is in connection to uh, goal 13 and target looking at strengthening of resilience and adaptive capacity. And of course, the integration of climate change measures into national policies, strategies, and planning. So this study was carried out uh, in a place in Kenya called Kwale County, and it was uh, looking at uh, women uh, who were members of women groups in Kwale. And um, first was to look at uh, where are they in terms of the effect of climate change, what's happening around them, and uh, again, what adaptation measures have they taken or strategies towards elevating their current circumstances. So on to the findings. Um, first of all, when it comes to uh, the effects, it was, uh, I established that mostly they had suffered negatively when it comes to the effects of climate change. Uh, the things that they identified to them as changing climate was rising temperatures, uh, change in um, rainfall patterns, um, extreme weather events. And when these things happened, they identified that uh, they had a lot of incidences of crop failure. There were issues with uh, reduction in crop productivity, a uh, lot of scarcity in terms of water, decline in quality of food, and uh, increased cost of food and water scarcity. When you look at uh, the poster here, right here, we find a woman fetching water for domestic use, but she's not fetching it from a river, but from a ditch. So you can imagine the extremes of the kind of effects that were happening around that time. And uh, on to the next objective in terms of adaptation, we find that uh, despite the fact that all these negative issues were happening around them, these women had come up with ways to move around their current circumstances. So um, one of the things that they were actually doing is that they were moving away from just relying on agriculture or uh, cultivation for their livelihoods and were now, being in, uh, now engaging in non-farm activities. And that's why we have a photo here showing some women doing some trading in the local market. And this was interesting because uh, the data that I had reviewed as literature was showing that um, the main source of livelihood uh, in this area was actually agriculture and uh, crop farming. But when I went to do my research, I found that, that because of what they were experiencing, they had actually moved away to something that would make them not so vulnerable to the effect. The other strategies that they were using were uh, things like water harvesting, irrigation, um, uh, being able to plant different crop varieties and all that. Another interesting thing is that um, all the strategies that they were using were more of short-term interventions rather than uh, long-term interventions because mostly there were other underlying challenges like inadequate capital to sustain their businesses, issues of maybe um, inadequate or absence of reliable uh, information when it comes to forecasting of weather. And so on to the conclusion is that um, in, in our country around this time, there were a lot of campaigns on com uh, awareness about climate change. But the fact is, is that people on the ground are actually aware that climate is changing and they are actively coming up with ways to, uh, to be able to counter the effects of climate change. And that's why um, 
I was rec I recommend that um, as we develop our policies in terms of climate change, it's important to factor in the autonomous adaptation strategies that are already happening on the ground, so that uh, there is uh, sentences or there is um, a sort of collaborative framework that uh, encompasses both the uh, the strategies coming from the top, from the national level, and also uh, from the ground. Also, another thing is that mostly women are mirrored as the vulnerable group. And perhaps maybe it's time to actually uphold the kind of uh, gap that they feel or the kind of input that they would have in terms of uh, supporting adaptation of climate change. So that is it for me, and I'm happy to have been given this opportunity. Thank you so much for another brilliant presentation and poster. Um, so just before we move on to the next section of the forum. Um, does anybody have any questions for our presenters? No. So I will sh now. I'll now share my screen and I'll show you um, which of the breakout rooms our presenters are going to be in, and then I'll sort of randomly allocate uh, everybody else to a room or let you guys choose which room you want to be in. Um, so just while I I'll let you guys have a look at that, just while I begin breaking everybody out. Oh God. Adam, was there like a, a guiding question for these breakout rooms, Some, something we're like supposed to be talking about? Yes, there is. And we will, I'll be slightly mysterious and okay, I'll let our hosts give that to you once okay. you're in your rooms. Thank you. Adam? Yes. Can you just confirm how long we're in the breakout rooms for? Uh, we'll be in the breakout rooms for approximately 10 to 15 minutes. I'll send an alert out when uh, when everybody is due Recording back. Recording stopped. Thank you. Hello everyone. Hello. Hi. Great, great presentations. It was wonderful. Oh, you too. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. Hi everyone. Hi. Hello. So Lela, why don't you tell us uh, the biggest dilemma that architects face? I mean, they want to make sustainable developments, but they want to do it again and again and again want to make more buildings so what is up <laughs> with these architects yeah um, that's a great question um <laughs> i think there's a lack of um, long-term vision which is what i'm trying to do uh, they're only looking at the next 20 or 30 years um, and reach the targets or the goals that whatever entity they're building for um, are doing and um, it's really great, but if you're looking at climate change, obviously it's really important, really urgent right now. But then you have the resource depletion challenge coming right after. So we're moving into cleaner energy, which is great, but then we use a lot of really critical materials in solar panels, for example. 
Um, so we don't know how to recycle those, reuse those. Um, so you see sometimes a little bit of a disconnection between people that want to go to um, cleaner and uh, green buildings and, and people that want to fit into a circular economy, for example, to address resources. Um, so what I'm trying to do is look really more longer term and more ways that we can start to implement um, all of them in harmony rather than um, yeah, changing strategies. So because obviously they're using today's standards or at least today what we want to see as the ballpark to design buildings, right? But then I mean, yeah. of course, then that's quite narrow minded because even if you want to make a building, it's going to take time. So there seems to be this disconnect between reality and what uh yeah, yeah. architects needs to do in terms of designing buildings yeah the building industry is really slow um it takes sometimes 20 years from an idea until a completion of the building and then it's outdated already um and you see that i think across different fields as well where policy is always behind um the state of the art because it needs time to be for policies to be implemented. but it is sometimes a push leader to go further and yeah change is slow uh, but that's why i think we researchers need to really be cutting edge and um, to try to push and sometimes be a bit more extreme in our views so that we really push people out of their comfort zone and they'll be more likely to accept you know uh, a bit less extreme views but this is my personal opinion <laughs> Um, yeah, so before I, uh, before I start setting people uh, questions, uh, the sort of main question I did just, I see you've already sort of kicked off the discussion, but uh, I wanted to ask if anybody had any more sort of specific or targeted questions for any of our presenters. Silence. Excellent. So I will get started with the sort of, we had one sort of broad question with a couple of little bits underneath it to cover in this breakout session um, and that is can each of these research projects be applied to your home country uh, and if so why and if not why not um, and sort of within that do any of these projects discussed today stand out as particularly relevant to climate change in your home country so I don't know if anybody wants to kick the kick off that answer Yeah, thank you. Oh, well, yes, because I mean, uh, the Indian Indian common law system is as such, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a heritage or a tradition of, of the empire, but it's evolved and it's more like a, it's often referred to as a living instrument. But what uh, uh, Baroness Hill says of your kingdom, uh, it's more like a living tree which is to say that it grows automatically and it's got these branches and doesn't need a violinist or a pianist to play it. So it's a wonderful system and the international system, as far as removed it is from reality, as an international re relations theorist would classify it, as, especially in the times of an international war, would say that there is a lot of lessons that the domestic systems can take from these international uh, instruments and countries are free to choose and adopt these principles as per their needs but if it becomes a part of an international court such as the international criminal court and a part of the Rome statute then it becomes binding on party nation states uh, incidentally India is not a part of the Rome statute but it does have environmental protection laws and the intention is really that the polluter does not play and that's what I tried to highlight through my presentation also. And the interesting thing about law is that it law transpires into all different sections of society and therefore would also transpire into architecture, which is what I was discussing with Leila before, before you pose the questions. It's an interesting aspect which can be explored further. And this can go up the other way around also. Architecture can also inspire legal, legal uh, 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 change because the law in some instances leads but in other instances lacks in terms of it following what the societal uh, uh, societal norms and regulations are so in that respect climate change and ecocide becomes a very relevant aspect for protecting the environment for those who belong to the generation for mine my generation and also to the generation which is not born yet this concept is known as intragenerational equity 
so that's what the motivation at least for me is to study this topic at a deeper level which is as a practical project international law as a practical undertaking Fantastic, thank you very much. Does anybody else have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I can, I can speak on this a little bit. <clears throat> um, yeah, well, I just want to say the projects that have been presented um, by my fellow people here have been just, just wonderful. Um, and I think all of them can be applied to every nation's plan. You know, this is a whole, whole portfolio that we're presenting. Uh, in every climate action plan, and all of them need to incorporate pieces of what everyone has said today. Um, just with the, the people here in this this room, environmental justice and eco, um, yeah, environmental justice needs to be a part of our plan, not only interge intergenerationally, but also developing versus developed. Um, this is, can start with um, financing the uh, adaptation, 100 billion goal um, that's already uh, past its due, but this is something we can we can continue um, acknowledging loss and damage and um, other things like that is, is just one step forward we can we can put into our plans, especially as the United States has a huge responsibility in historical emissions and in solving this, this problem. Um, second, uh, Lila, I loved your your presentation. Um, incorporating good architecture for the future so we can keep moving forward and maintaining. Um, um, our buildings and things and continuing to growing in a sustainable way is, is really important. Um, and then Anna, yeah, protecting our, our forests, our cultures, it, it, we, we have to maintain what we have um, and support the people we have right now, but also continue to grow as well. So um, I think incorporating all of these ideas is, is really important for a robust climate action plan. Fantastic. I see Anna's got her hand up now. Yeah, but I think uh, Lila raised hers first. So. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. I didn't even get a chance to see yours go up, Lila. Um, does anybody have any? Want to go first? Yeah. Shall I go first? And I'll sure. You, because I think I want to jump on Anna. Uh, because for you explained, I think it's also really analyzing uh, where you are locally and analyzing the relationships and how it goes. And I think as much as Thomas is right that we need to incorporate all these aspects to have a full picture of. Uh, to tackle climate action. I do think as well, um, we can use the same method, but you also need to put it back into your context, your local context, which can be country, but it can be regional as well, because um, sometimes countries are a little bit, uh, that don't make sense in some aspects, um, when you have, for example, a forest region spanning tree country. Um, and I think we really need to be mindful of that, that not one solution fits everywhere. Uh, the ideas behind them, yes, uh, some methods, probably also yes, but really still think critically and would it work uh, in the context. And I'm sure Anna, you've got something to say about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth, really. Uh, I was just going to say that, yeah, exactly, I do agree with Thomas as well. They, they all can be implemented in different countries. However, I do think that it's important to consider the scale in which we're going to implement these things. For example, everything that you talked about, why I feel like it's super interesting, is to see how these new shapes of architecture can work. Um, but for example, I don't see that happening in Mexico City, right? I don't think it's going to be possible to just continue developing the city that way. But maybe uh, for other cities, which are just in the process of developing and of growing, um, that would be a great uh, place to implement your strategy, for example. But yeah, I don't want to sound redundant because I was going to say a lot of the points that you touched, but yeah. I think uh, I'd like to comment the presentation uh, on climate change and the various architectural designs. I was just wondering if this applies across the, uh, across the whole world because we've got very unique architectural designs in Africa, for example. I don't know if that was put in consideration. Maybe uh, you can respond to that. Yeah, sure. Um, so this is very vague and conceptual, as you've seen, uh, and very long term. But I found out that the more extreme the environment, the more relevant the framework becomes, because um, first of all, you're analyzing all the context. So what the people need, um, and that has strong ties with culture as well. 
uh, but also what um, the environment is and kind of using the environment to the advantage of the building, which is very different wherever you are, um, whether you're in a busy city where you deal with urban heat island effects or where you're in a very rural area um, that doesn't have like strong daily rhythms. Um, so it would work really great in the sense that it is really um, teaching the buildings to adapt to the environment and make the most out of it. But how are we going to make that technologically possible? We're not there yet. Uh, we're looking at the biotechnologies. So I do think that the framework really calls for um, rethinking locally and not one solution fits all, because that is, in my opinion, uh, by definition, unsustainable, because we've seen how if we all do the same, we don't have enough resources or energy to do it. Uh, also, not enough time. And as I mentioned, I'm looking at, for example, this Martian habitat case study, where Martian habitat is very um, interesting because Martian environment is really harsh, and we have basically zero resources, and we cannot bring them from Earth. It's really difficult. So how do you deal with uh, very little resources uh, and very difficult climate? How can you still create a habitat using those very few resources? Um, and that really helps you rethink how you uh, design buildings. Um, and that's what I want to bring back to Earth in a sense, um, to rethink locally. I hope I'm answering your question. Yes, you have, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Anki, you got your hand up. Yeah, I have. And I just want to add to that. I think um, uh, if there is a common thread which weaves all these discussions in is that climate change affects all of us. It's not that it's a third world problem or it's a first world problem. Um, all the first world problems are much more uh, smaller and easily, easily can be easily dealt with. Uh, but what I just wish to highlight and which affects affects uh, an edifice also is climate migrants, right? Uh, climate migrants, at least a decade ago, uh, did not really exist in the dictionary of anyone, at least to my limited knowledge so uh, and what does that essentially mean that the that the building of the edifice that you live in is no longer hospitable or perhaps in some instances doesn't even exist anymore uh, the neighboring countries of India which open up into the Indian Ocean uh, are facing these issues countries such as Bangladesh countries such as those in the southeast or in the southern regions of India are also facing these issues and to this front, the small island nation states have come together along with a couple of states belonging to the African continent to come together and say that we need to do something about this. So it's not only that the that it, in these international lobbies you have a dominance by, by these first world nation states, it's these smaller nation states whose very existence is that question have taken the mantle of change and through and change through international law because the language of law uh, dominates the language of all other policies and all other discussions uh, my, my perspective is of course colored here yeah, because i belong to the to the law school uh, and i'm also influenced by international relations because that's where my that's that's where i did my my studies as a bachelor student but of course all of this has merit to it in terms of it coming as a as a sort of an example for other nation states to come together and it's not just that uh, only these actions can take place at a state level or the central level uh, i belong to a very very interesting place in, in india which is designed by a swiss french architect who went on to design the un building in new york now this gentleman said that i'm going to design my city like in blocks so it's similar to to let's say barcelona or to to Paris, so it's in blocks, right? And there are thirty percent of the entire city is covered by green forests. You can't touch these forests. So these are measures which which the states or the cent or the or the let's say a specific area or a or a regional government can also adopt to protect the environment. So it's not that it can only take place at the United Nations. It can also take place in an entire city, which is which is a which is an tiny part in the vastness of of the glorious. Um, Indian subcontinent. Anna? Yeah, um, another thing that I would like to bring to the table, which I think is uh, very important and very closely related to all of the projects that have been presented today, is the fact that um, this like notion of time, right? How we need to plan things to be on the long term and not on the short term. and. I think we've all talked about it, whether it be carbon sequestration or um, the international law or architecture 
or conservation of forests. I think one of the biggest problems that we face, whether it be regional, local, or global, is uh, trying to convince everyone that this is a problem that's like on the long run and that the um, strategies that we use are not going to show immediate effects where we have to wait. And I think that uh, patience is probably one of the hardest things um, when we're trying to discuss uh, sustainability around the world. Uh, yeah, Layla. That in one space. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's really um, a bit maybe pessimistic view of being patient and I think patience is really important, but also seeing how everyone here has been presenting their own perspective. I think there is a big group of people that know the urgency of it. And there is always this sense that we want to see um, gains pass because that's how we work as humans. We want to have this uh, <laughs> quickly. So if something is happening, we're doing good. Uh, but also long term as well. So maybe that's also something we need to think of. How do we combine both that they can kind of work together? Um, and maybe that's the key of us working uh, transdisciplinary. Um, because something you go for a forest, like um, Ankit said, it will have an impact for the built environment. Uh, and policies can help tie that together. Um, and it's all, I don't know, I feel it's really difficult, but um, discussions like this really makes you see the bigger picture, the bigger perspective, and therefore also maybe longer term. Um, so that was my main tip I wanted to add. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, we've got about two minutes left before uh, the breakout rooms close and we go back to the main group for the sort of last little bit of the, of the forum. Did anybody have any final thoughts or questions? No, in that case, I think if, if you don't mind, I'll just sum up roughly what we've talked about when we get back to everybody. I think in broad terms, the answer to the question that was posed is yes, all of the projects are relevant to everybody because we're all connected in some way or another, be that by migration or uh, climate migration or sort of international bodies, etc. But at the same time, we should take that view with a pinch of salt and put things in their local context to ensure that they're effective. And also, obviously, one of the big issues is uh, sort of understanding uh, time and patience and using measures that impact at all levels from international, national to local to ensure that we see sort of both short, those short term fast gains that everybody likes and the actual long term progress that we need. Is everybody happy with that as a summary? Excellent. Then I will close us off a minute early and we can wait oh, for to to add one item. Yeah, of course. Into your summary, I think uh, application into the different settings will also take into perspective the cultural settings and the natural resources available. Sure. In the different settings. Thank you. No, fantastic. I will be sure to make reference to the different sort of cultural settings and natural environments when I talk about different uh, different applying measures in their context. Um, okay, well, I'll close the room now and I'll see you all back in the main room shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Recording in progress. I believe that's all of us back for now. So welcome back to the main room, everybody. Uh, I hope you all had some fantastic discussions uh, in your breakout rooms. Um, I'll kick off from with a bit of a summary of what, uh, what we discussed in our breakout rooms just then. Um, so in broad terms, the answer to it, the question, do uh, these research projects impact all of us in our sort of different home countries. Our answer to that was absolutely yes. Um, but at the same time, it's important that we take into consideration different local contexts in terms of culture and environment and in terms of availability of resources when we're seeking to uh, apply solutions to climate change. Um, 
and equally we also discussed um, the, the, um, the, the idea of time and the importance of balancing sort of short-term gains that everybody, that humans naturally want to see versus the long-term uh, benefits that we need to see uh, for climate action. Um, do, does, does either one of Chris or Christina want to come in here and talk about your groups? Yeah, if you want, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, it was similar with us as well. Like we definitely agreed that this, this type of uh, research can be implemented, but again, like it, it, it is very complex because you need to take into account like a lot of factors just to kind of make sure that like you're implementing it uh, based on like something that it could be good for humanity, but like also for like the environment in itself as well. So like it, it all really depends. Uh, we were also kind of like talking about like if this could be like some of this like projects could be implemented uh, or transfer into industry because sometimes like that is like quite difficult and depending on like what the gains are for like each one of the parties involved. Um, and also like how like sometimes implementing this type of things it really it, like it really relies on like what the policies and like guidelines of each government is because like we were talking about like Georgia's research and how there's like specific laws about like what you can do like you can and cannot do so i think that that's really important and also kind of like bearing in mind um kind of like taking into account like government issues that you might be facing and how can you address those issues whilst making sure that you want to tackle kind of like climate change i think that that's also important so yeah like those were some of the things that that, that we included, but it's definitely like some just kind of hearing at all the presentations. I think it was like really encouraging to see what everyone is doing and just to kind of like really see that there's there's hope because a lot of people are really working on this. Fantastic. Thanks, Christina. Um, Chris, would you mind popping in for a second? Yes. Yeah, so um, our group is in agreement. We think that definitely the research can be applied in our own um, home countries. But some of the concepts we talked about can also be applied even beyond our borders and on a more international scale. Uh, one of the things we spoke about was um, if we could sensitize people to the importance of climate change, it can help firstly on a local level and then consequently on um, an international level as well. So um, we kind of concluded by saying that there would be an easier implementation of activities or legislations if people understood um, from a climate point of view how their actions um, can in turn impact the climate, uh, the environment, yeah. That's fantastic, thank you so much. It sounds like all of the breakout discussions were really sort of interesting and meaningful. So that's yeah, really positive. Um, so just before we move on, uh, I think I will share my screen again and play us the closing remarks from Professor Sharma at OP Jindal. Indiana University, our strategic partner, for giving us an opportunity to be one amongst the six international partner universities to participate in the 2022 Global Partner Research focusing on SDG 13 Climate Action. Partaking in this poster contest, our students were really encouraged. They were encouraged to engage in deliberate and deliberate on the issue of climate change specifically the need for immediate climate action. The terrible forest fires, droughts, landslides, floods, water shortage, and soaring temperatures, which continue unabated, efforts are required on all fronts to make a difference. We are engulfed in a climate emergency. The resilience with which the world has now emerged after COVID-19 is a positive sign for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals to be adopted and pursued with utmost rigor and full consciousness for countries and across the regions. Initiatives like the UN SDG Poster Forum involve engagement and deliberations of a very important stakeholder, the youth. 
youth consciousness stands right at the center to be able to make a difference in the climate crisis. Therefore, this is a wonderful opportunity for the students across the world to engage, deliberate on challenges that are presented while combating the climate crisis. We are indeed great, grateful for the platform so provided. I'm sure, as is evident, this has made them think creatively, learn new skills, concomitantly, they must have learned environmental values, cultural values, social values. And it is evident from their research that they've incorporated a solution-based approach. I would like to mention too, that United Nations has always favored diversity. Diversity being such an important thing. And the organizers have been thoughtful and have done a commendable job by including varying perspectives and insights with representatives from across the globe. And I'm one of the representatives. So I'm sure this has been an enriching experience for the students as well as the mentors. Good night and stay well and be at it. This is Professor Charu Sharma signing off from Kopi Jindal Kopi University. Yeah, well, I couldn't have put it much better myself. Um, so unless anybody has any other business, then I will thank you all very much for coming um, and very much look forward to reviewing the recording of this session on uh, our partner website, which, um, which will go live in the coming weeks. And yeah, thank you all so much for being here. It's been a really entertaining and thought provoking session. I'm really looking forward to talking more about it soon. Thank you.